Okay, wait, wait, wait. My name is Janice Law. I'm the founder of American Women Writers National Museum, and today is our third anniversary. I found the museum uh, three years ago, it, uh, intentionally around Valentine's Day, because it's a women, to, uh, it's a museum to honor women writers, and so I thought founding it around Valentine's Day would be great. And uh, we don't have a physical building yet. I decided instead of starting with brick and mortar, I would start with uh, programs. So now that we have passed the third year mark, which is the time you can get grants, uh, usually more easily, uh, then we're going to start a big fundraising uh, for a brick and, mortar, a brick and uh, mortar. So now, would everyone please join me in singing happy birthday to Autumn. Go! Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Autumn. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker. We're very honored. Uh, I'm going to introduce Pat Kreider, of course, later, but I'm going to first uh, introduce our first speaker is Christopher Reich. And uh, Christopher is in uh, common language, a very big deal. <laughs> he is the uh, senior advisor to the Department of Museum Services for the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is the main federal funding agency for museums and libraries in the United States. And Christopher has always been, from the beginning, very, very supportive of Autumn, and we appreciate that. He's honored us today with his presence. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the organization, in case you don't know anything about it, and a little bit about his work, and then I'll introduce Ms. Kreider. So, this Well, thank you, and good afternoon. I, I was talking to Janice on the phone last night and having a bit of a meltdown after a long day. I said, do you really need me tomorrow? <laughs> and she said, yes. <laughs> so, We're glad you're here. Yes. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'd like to begin, though, by saying thank you to Janice for inviting me once again uh, to share a few thoughts before the museum's monthly program presentation, but especially on the occasion of the third anniversary of this project. Um, I was thinking it was about three years ago that I first met Janice, but I did have time this morning to check our calendars, and it was April 2011, almost four years ago, that we first talked, and she visited my office here in Washington, D.C. at the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And as part of her invitation to speak today, she asked if I remembered that first meeting, and the question that I she remembers me posing to her was asking her whether I thought she could sustain her enthusiasm for her project concept for a museum honoring American women writers. Mm -hmm. And my recollection is just a little bit different, mm -hmm. because I think I counseled her about the challenges of starting up a museum, and asked whether she could sustain the level of perseverance that would be necessary to make it a reality. And so now, those of you who know Janice know that was a fairly ridiculous <laughs> question. <laughs> I mean, I've had the pleasure of knowing and working for and with a number of remarkable women over the years, and few can compare to Janice for when it comes to perseverance and single-minded dedication to turning an idea into a reality. Um, somebody I know reminded me of a quote by Vince Lombardi that goes like this, the difference between a successful person and others is not a lack of strength, not a lack of knowledge but rather a lack of will. Um, that quote certainly captures us the successes of the American Women Writers National Museum Project over these past three years. So Janice very graciously said I could share a few thoughts about the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And just like Onum, we have an acronym, and it's called IMLS. And we actually are a federal agency uh, located right here in DC. And our mission is to inspire libraries and museums to advance innovation, lifelong learning, and cultural and civic engagement. We provide leadership through research, policy, development, and grant making. And we're probably most well known for our grant making. And I brought along, for those of you that are interested, you know, our most recent publication that summarizes the grants that we give. Um, 
We're a really small federal agency with barely 70 employees, um, but we like to think of ourselves as small but mighty because we are, as Janice said earlier, the, the nation's primary support for our 123,000 libraries and 35,000 museums. And our Office of Museum Services, where I work, has an annual budget of about $30 million. And last year, we were able to provide grants to almost 250 museums of all kinds and sizes. And these grants support museums in three areas. Uh, grants to provide engaging learning experiences that help to prepare individuals to be full participants in their local communities and our global society. Grants to promote museums as community anchors that enhance civic engagement, cultural opportunities, and economic vitality. And grants to support exemplary stewardship of the collections that are entrusted to museums by the public. So I just wanted to share a few thoughts about museums, given that this is the third, third anniversary of this project. You know, we think museums are the places where we preserve collections and the knowledge they contain the memories they capture, and the stories they tell. Museums are the places that care for and interpret the priceless objects that document the history of our communities. Museums might be about art, nature, science, history, um, and IMLS, we consider living uh, collections to be part of the museum family too, so we include zoos, aquariums, botanical gardens, and nature centers. Um, museums of all kinds are the places that provide access for people of all ages and backgrounds to the knowledge contained within their collections through their year-round schedules of exhibitions and programs. Museums are proven to be trusted institutions where people from diverse backgrounds can come together to discover and learn about science, art, nature, and history and also to celebrate the diverse cultures that make up the America that we know today. If you think about it, the United States is really still a very young country, and we at IMLS continue to see projects like this one developing each year as older generations seek ways to preserve their stories and younger generations seek ways to discover what came before them. I remember the enthusiasm when I was privileged to attend the brass band opening <laughs> of this museum back Salvation in, Army brass band. Yeah, <laughs> there was even dancing. <laughs> that was back in February of 2012. And as we celebrate the third anniversary of this remarkable project, I think we can surely say that this museum has offered audiences a sub substantive number of engaging learning experiences that have expanded participants like you use knowledge um, of an important component of our American heritage. If you hadn't had a chance, and I think most of you had to look at the museum's website, I'd encourage you to do so because so many of these presentations have been preserved on video, and that allows those who couldn't be present to enjoy them over time. Opportunities to hear from novelists, screenwriters, poets, journalists, editors, playwrights, and more have highlighted the contributions that these amazing women have made to the fabric of our shared heritage. So just in concluding, surely I think we all agree that the words of America's women writers tell the story of this great country in ways that we all want to discuss, ways that we want to preserve and cherish for future generations. While we may not see bricks and mortar for this museum yet, a substantive body of programming has established the value of its mission and certainly called attention to the contributions of women's, women writers to our nation's and indeed the world's history and development. So I congratulate and applaud Janice and all her volunteers and members for their perseverance and dedication and look forward to many great things to come in the years ahead. And it's been a great privilege to share in parts of your journey, and I wish you great success in the future. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer questions about IMLS after the presentation. Well, thank you, Christopher. I, I couldn't have asked for more uh, eloquence and uh, beautiful remarks, and beautifully thought through and beautifully done. Thank you so much. Our uh, next, our main speaker uh, this afternoon is Patricia Kreider. She's the executive director of the First Ladies 
Library and Museum in Canton, Ohio. And Pat has graced us with her presence, I think it's the third year now, she's a, for our anniversary event. Uh, she's uh, very, very knowledgeable. And she brought with her two of her associates, and I'll just let them introduce themselves so I don't mangle their names. <laughs> this is Kristen. Uh, Lucinda Fraley. Lucinda. Call me Cindy. Please okay. call me that. <laughs> okay. I'm the education director there at the First Ladies. Okay. Lucinda? And I'm Michelle Gullion. Um, I'm the archives director at the National First Ladies Library. Okay. We're very glad to have all of you. And since this lecture is going to be on First Ladies and the on call, <laughs> oh, <shucks. laughs> I always, I told Pat, I just showed her this before, this is a Ouija board. Uh, and so if I introduce, I, I, there's a little thing that you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first place me, I'll, I just, I just take it out of this paper, but anyway, it points the letters, so I'll pretend that I'm doing P. K-R-I-D-E-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-R-S-A-
a kind of funny story is that Hillary Clinton, when she's first starting out at First Lady, she's kind of struggling with many of the issues. And she admired Eleanor <coughs> Roosevelt. And so a psychologist suggested that as you struggle how to deal with different issues, why don't you think about how would Eleanor Roosevelt handle these issues? How would she have handled these issues? Well, the press gets a hold of this, and they twist it around, and they decide to put out there that Hillary Clinton is channeling Eleanor <laughs> Roosevelt. <laughs> and Hillary, she just goes with it. And so from that point on, as press is hounding her daily about different issues, she starts saying, well, I just talked to Eleanor. <laughs> <laughs> this is what she said. <laughs> and, you know, she writes a letter to... Um, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, given the latest flap over my imaginary conversations with Mrs. R, I'll be sure to pass on your greetings the next time we talk. <laughs> and this, this whole situation continues on to the 2008 presidential campaign, and we see a cartoon here. I also have a major endorsement from the ghost of Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, other first ladies involved in, in uh, some type of spiritualism, we have Jane Pierce. You know, Jane Pierce, Victorian first lady, and we find that in the Victorian age, there's a very strong interest in the occult, in spiritualism. Jane Pierce has, has a tough life. She's lost two sons. She actually loses a third son in a horrible train action just after her husband is elected president. And she goes into this horrible, deep mourning. And she longs to have her son back. And, you know, kind of in this Victorian way that they mourn, she wants to, to talk to her son and begs his forgiveness for not loving him enough while he was alive, you know. And so she starts, she writes these long letters to Benny you know, begging him to come back so she could explain her failings as a mother, which I'm sure she didn't have any, but, you know, this is what she kind of thought. And there's a picture of, of, of Jane Pierce with Benny. And then she goes on and she invites uh, some famous young spiritualists, the Fox sisters, to come to the White House, and they conduct seances. And Jane Pierce kind of says that she did find relief. We don't know if it was whether it was her letter writing or the seances, but um, she writes to her sister that her dead son, Benny, came to, to see her um, in a succession of dreams. And so she was able to resolve her issues. And that's Jane Pierce with the Fox sisters, famous spiritualists at the time. Julia Tyler as a former first lady, and again, this kind of shows the popularity of the spiritualism and the occult at this time, she sponsors an evening of levitation, magnetic powers, and the conjuring up of spirits from the great beyond. But she kind of has her doubts, so she sponsors this evening, but she's, she's not too sure about it. And a, a young woman levitates a table. And so Jane's response is, instead of being terrified, I was very glad I witnessed what, what is, without a doubt, the magnetic influence of the body and not some supernatural agency. Moving ahead to the 1910s, um, we have Edith Galt, and there was a famous, famous spiritualist, medium, um, astrologist in Washington, D.C., named Madame Marshall, and everyone went to see Madame Marshall. So Edith Galt consults Madame Marshall in 1914. Later we find Florence Harding also consults her. And Madame Marsha tells Edith Galt that somehow she's going to become connected to a presidential family and she's going to live in the White House. And of course, Edith marries um, Woodrow, Edith says, well, if that prediction comes through, I'm going to invite you to the White House, Madam Marshall, and you're going to come in the public entrance. Well, Edith marries Woodrow. She does 
invite Madam Marsha to the White House, but she brings her in a more quiet <laughs> <laughs> coming in the front door. So there were three of the first ladies who were very, very, very into spiritualism and into the occult. And those three first ladies were Mary Lincoln, Florence Harding, Nancy Reagan, all from very, very, very different times. But an interesting thing, they became first lady exactly 60 years apart. So Mary Lincoln becomes first lady in 1861, those Victorian times, Florence Harding in 1921, and then Nancy Reagan in 1981. These three are very well-educated women, very intelligent women, um, very politically astute, all three of them and uh, come from wealthy families. Nancy Reagan, not when she's first born, but then when her mom marries uh, Dr. Loyal Davis, they, they have a, a substantial um, wealth. Uh, like I said, all were well, very well, well educated. So we have Mary Lincoln, poor Mary Lincoln. She suffered the loss of three of her four sons. And in between, she also witnesses the assassination of her husband. And again, this is Victorian times where, you know, you're in the deep mourning. <laughs> so, one son, Eddie, she loses before becoming First Lady. Second son, Willie, she's actually in the White House. It's 1862. There's actually a, a party going on, a reception in the White House, and, and Willie is sick up in one of the bedrooms. And he passes away, and he's 11 years old from typhoid fever. And here's the sad part. Civil war is going on, and the public had very little sympathy for Mary Lincoln, for the Lincolns losing this young son. And the feeling was, well, you know what? Our sons are out getting killed on the battlefield, and we're not getting a chance to say goodbye. At least you had a chance to say goodbye to your young son. Isn't that sad? Mm -hmm. So Mary Lincoln, she's devastated at these losses, and she begins contacting mediums, and she's contacted a number of them. She, she attends um, seances from a man named Cranston Lorry. She invites a woman, Nettie Colburn Maynard, uh, to the White House, along with a man named William Shockle, and someone else called the Colchester of Georgetown, conducts seances on the, at, the, at the White House. And, and at least one occasion, Lincoln was, in pres uh, was present. Mary Lincoln does claim that the spirits of her dead sons appeared in her White House bedroom. She writes her sister about Willie. He comes to me every night and stands at the foot of my bed with the same sweet, adorable smile he has always had. He does not come alone. Little Eddie is sometimes with him. And we have a photo of, of Willie and Eddie. The, this Cranston Lorry also talks to Mary Lincoln that he's, he's seeing information from spirits that there's enemies surrounding her husband. And of course, Mary Lincoln clashes with Lincoln's cabinet, with his, with his allies all the time. And so when Cranston Lorry tells her this, this is proof to Mary Lincoln in her mind that Treasury Secretary uh, Salmon Chase was, um, was being disloyal to Lincoln. And, you know, his daughter, Kate Chase, was one of the women in Washington who spread terrible rumors about Mary Lincoln, that she was backwater, that they were unsophisticated, that they were uncouth, and this went on for years. And then Lincoln is assassinated before Mary Lincoln's eyes at Ford's Theater. And her interest in spiritualism is just intensified. Um, she reportedly goes to some spiritualist commune for, for um, several days during a New England trip. She poses for um, this photograph with this man named, named William Mumler, who is a spirit photographer. You know, all of these. All these people come out of the woodwork in the Victorian times to take advantage of, of the Victorian people's grief. And so you have this 
spirit photographer, William Mumler, and, and she poses for a photo. And Mary believes that it's authentic. And basically, the ghost of Lincoln has his hands on Mary's shoulders. And it's this creepy image. Um, and he does a ton of these. And people are like, oh, this is my dead son or my dead husband or whatever. And Mary truly believes that that's Lincoln's ghost behind her. And, and in reality, it's something that this William Mumbler put together. So now we move on 60 years later, and we have Florence Harding. Florence Harding is just an adult belie believer in all types of spirit rituals. It's just something she's always believed in her whole entire life. Um, she becomes a believer because she gets information from German immigrants who um, leased land from her father. And they would have hex signs on their barns, and she learns all about the occult from them, and she just really buys into it. She's into the stars, and she tells her, um, her niece that, the, that um, you can learn about the future from the stars, from the constellations. And she says, the only aspect of life which one could rely upon as true were the stars. <coughs> Nineteen eighty, there's a Harding Home caretaker who says that she attended a spiritualist camp in Indiana. Her nineteen twenty campaign secretary would would state how superstitious she was. If a maid would put a pair of shoes on a bed, she would just go crazy and say, No, you can't do that because that's really bad luck. And she she contacted a number of different astrologers. And she also um, um, went to see Madame Marsha. Madame Marsha comes back in again. This is the same woman that, that uh, did the reading for Edith Galt Wilson. She's actually introduced to Miss Madame Marsha by her friend Evelyn McLean Walsh, who is very wealthy. She's the one that owned the Hope Diamond, the, the cursed Hope Diamond. So Florence Harding goes to Madame Marsha and she gives all the birth details of, of um, Warren Harding. And she wants to know if Warren is going to get the Republican nomination. And Marsha says, oh yes, he's going to get the nomination and he's going to win the election, but it's going to cost him his life. And so Florence Harding, she's at the Republican National Convention in 1920 and she tells the press, if my husband is, is elected, I can see but one word hanging over his head, tragedy, tragedy, and actually that's two words. <laughs> <laughs> so she continues to um, consult with Madame Marsha, and she sends her letters, and by design she signs the letters Jupiter, so this is how Madame Marsha knows it's from Florence Hardy. The newspapers get a hold of this. And they publish letters signed by Jupiter. Florence doesn't care. She's, she said, like, "Yeah, I'm into I'm into astrology. Why not? Why don't you use anything that can help guide your future?" And because she comes out and she admits it, the whole story fizzles. Oh man, we can't get anything out of this. So She would send her secret service agent to get Madame Marsha in and bring her to the White House. And then she again would bring her in through a more private entrance. Um, supposedly, Madame Marsha would use a crystal ball. And she would go into trances to warn about, um, about problems in the administration. Uh, but primarily, she was supposed to just do the, the um, zodiac for Lawrence Hardy. And there's Madame Marsha working on astrology charts for the Hardings. Her friend Evelyn Walsh McLean later on uh, in taped interviews attest to the fact that Florence was very into the occult, that this was not something that was made up for the press, that she believed in it, and she strictly adhered to astrology. And then Madame Marsha, of course, had to have her say in 1938 Liberty Magazine. She, of course, 
claimed that she had a lot more um, influence in the White House than she really did. And the, the title of one of the articles was, When an Astrologer Ruled the White House. So we kind of see this theme come up later on as well. Neither Warren or, or uh, Florence, they weren't, um, they weren't hesitant about, about saying that they believed in this stuff. They, just, they didn't care what the people thought. You know, they were like, yeah, we're into it. Why not? <laughs> Harding never, never belittled. She never said, really, Florence, what are you doing there? It was just something they did. And then our third first lady was Nancy Reagan. Nancy Reagan, who is just distraught after the assassination attempt on, um, on Ronald Reagan. She's <clears throat> so afraid of his, for his safety. And she's looking for some additional means besides secret service and whatever to keep him safe, to protect him. And she uses astrology to look for safe days and unsafe days in his schedule. She gets uh, a hold of a woman named Joan Quigley, and her friend Murphy Griffin kind of tells her about Joan, although she'd met Joan a couple of years before, she didn't really remember. So she contacts Joan Quigley, and she tells Joan, she said, I'm scared every time he leaves the house, can you help? Can you come up with charts that basically tell us good days and bad days for him to go out in public, for him to make speeches? And they would actually adjust his schedule, comparing to what um, whatever Joan would tell you that her. And, and Ronald Reagan knew about it. And he says, you know what, if it makes you feel better, go ahead and do it. Don't let it come out public mm -hmm. that this is happening. And so, and so um, most of the consultations were by phone. Nancy Reagan pays Joan Quigley through a third party, through a friend. So there's no tracing of the money. Um, from her. She only came to the White House once, and it was for his 1985 state dinner, and that's the only time that Reagan met Joan Quigley. Um, but the Reagans, of course, had been in Hollywood, you know, from the 1940s, um, and in Hollywood there was always a lot of popularity with spiritualism and the occult and seances and astrology. And they had long before met um, another astrologist, Carol Ryder, Astrology to the Stars. Well, as happens with these things, the news goes public. And the way that the news goes public is that um, former Chief of Staff Don Regan, who him and, him and Nancy Reagan butted heads from the start. They didn't get along, they didn't like each other, and you know, it, it said that, that Nancy Reagan had strong influence in getting him fired. So he gets fired and he decides to put out a book. And in the book, he wants to get back at Nancy Reagan. And you know, because he's sure that he wouldn't have been fired except for her. And so he basically writes this book saying that an astrologer is ruling the White House and that everything that Reagan does is dependent on what this astrologer says. His schedule, his, his uh, most important life moments are dictated by Joan Quigley. And of course the media goes crazy, the White House is being run by an astrologer, blah blah blah. And it's, you have know, Time Magazine, Astrology in the White House. And then Nancy publishes her book the next year. And she says, she didn't deny it. She said, yes, I used astrology. Really, I wanted any means to help keep my husband safe. And it didn't hurt anything. Well, astrology was a factor in determining Rodney's schedule. It was never the only one. And no political decision was ever based on it. That's what she said. And that's her book. And then Joan has to come out. <laughs> My seven years as the White House astrologer to Ronnie and Nancy. And um, oh, what, what does Joan say? It's supposedly 
when um, something would come up on a scheduling issue, supposedly Ronald would say to Nancy, well, Nancy, what does Joan say about this? <laughs> this is according to Joan. Um, and she's saying, I was responsible for timing all press conferences, most speeches, the State of the Union address, the takeoffs and landings of Air Force One. I picked the time of Reagan's debate with Carter and the two dates with, with uh, Walter Mondale. I'll extend trips abroad as well as shorter trips and one day excursions. And then we have, you know, how I ran the White House and other, you know, the same deal like the party school. And then she goes on, you know, and she's not even done. She, she goes on and she says, she advised on the timing of cancer surgery. <laughs> and, you know, and she advised uh, on his relationship with Gorbachev. And she's, she says, so goes Ali, Ronnie's evil empire attitude has to go. Gorbachev's Aquarian planet is in such harmony with Ronnie, you'll see they'll share a vision. <laughs> but, you know, why were these first ladies, you know, so into astrology? Why would there are the occult seances? You know, again, they're all intelligent, they're all well educated, they're well informed women. But they lived at times when there was this popular interest in spiritualism. And they all had issues that they needed to resolve. So it wasn't um, very unusual that they would do this. Um, people in the Victorian age, again, I mentioned this, they have this preoccupation with death, especially during the Civil War. They're losing loved ones. They want to reconnect. And they get into seances and all those types of things. From about 1919 into the 1940s, Okay, the hard time period of the Hardings, also a time period when the Reagans are in Hollywood. There's new claims that, you know, that occult, that spiritualism is true, that it's real. And so we have the freewheeling 1920s, people are in different things. We have people in the, the 30s and 40s, there's the Great Depression, they're looking for hope. And, you know, magicians are really, really, really popular during this time period. And one thing that I always find that's interesting is that Houdini, you know, the, the very famous magician, is he's looking way, for ways to debunk the um, mediums. He goes and he goes to seances trying to find what their trickery is. And I always find that very unusual since Houdini's <laughs> whole career was based on trickery. So, hmm. um, 1960s, you know, again, freewheeling, you know, people are against the government, they're looking for new ways, you know, they're, they're turning against God, and so they kind of turn into this whole astrology and, you know, horoscopes and 1980s and mood rings and all these things. And so, like I said, the Reagans kind of experienced this in, in two areas, 1940s and then the new wave in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so, something to ponder. Will there be another wave of real popularity? And will the man or woman who becomes first spouse in 2041, 60 years from Nancy Reagan, have an acute interest? You know, we'll have to see. And then lastly, we did have a first lady who was a naysayer, and that was Dolly Madison. Dolly Madison's niece, Mary Cutts, writes to Dolly about a prediction that a fortune teller uh, gave to Mary about her future life. And in response, Dolly Madison, in, on August 1st, 1833, writes to Mary, may your fortune, dearest Mary, be even better than Sybil's predictions. There is one secret, however, she did not tell you, and that is the power we all have in forming our own destinies. Thank you.
Yes, I'm curious why, when you said in the White House, they all felt the presence of Lincoln. Yeah. Why Lincoln in particular? I mean, oh. he didn't actually die there, and there were other presidents that lived there. I know, and, and, it's, and it's strange because it's that um, people maybe heard the cries of Francis Cleveland giving birth in the White House. But it is unusual. You never hear about anyone talking about Letitia Tyler, who dies in the White House, or Carolyn Harrison. It's just, it's Lincoln. I don't know, because maybe they think that it's going to be interesting. <laughs> I have a question. Go, please. Um, you know, I read, uh, you know, when uh, Willie would appear at, uh, you know, the foot of Lincoln's bed, that, you know, he was frustrated that he wasn't able to communicate, you know, with Willie. But so you can weigh in on that. And then also, you know, to what degree do you believe, you know, it was a hallucination or a ghost? I mean, Lincoln seemed of sound mind most much of the time. Right. And, you know, but again, they're buying into this whole Victorian, you know, we need to connect. And, and I will tell you is without getting into my beliefs or whatever, um, as part of our site, we have a, an old home. It's the family home of First Lady Ida Saxton McKinley, and it was our first physical location. And it was built in 1841 and then added on to in 1865, and, and that was our first building, and that we, it's where we had our offices and we would conduct tours. And staff and volunteers from the time I first started would always say they hated to go to the basement of the house, that they just felt something in the basement. And I was like, no, I never feel anything in the basement, but we would have to go around at the end of the day and we'd have to turn lights off. And there's a third floor ballroom. And there's a, the slowest elevator in the whole world to take you up to the third floor and get off the elevator and you'd have to walk across the room to turn the lights off. And, and that elevator would always close and go down to another floor. That's where I felt a presence. It was the third floor ballroom. I hated it. I would like, I, I tried to time it to get back to that elevator. <laughs> the interesting thing is recent um, research has shown that when Ida and William lived in the Saxon McKinley house, which they did at various times over his career, they probably used the ballroom as their living quarters because McKinley's office was off of that ballroom, and so it was probably their living quarters, their reception quarters. So if I was feeling a presence, it may have been Ida. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, you kind of, I was just wondering how the First Lady's Library evolved in Canton, Ohio. Well, actually, uh, the library, uh, the National First Ladies Library, we're a private nonprofit, was started by uh, a congressman's wife, and he was she's from Ohio, and so that's how it got started there. And um, then in uh, October of 2000, the First Ladies National Historic Site was established. They kind of took over the properties, and we are the private prop, uh, partner. We manage and operate the site. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, in that book, you should talk about really an elevated something. With, yes, an yeah. elevated position. Yeah. Yes, the catalog. Uh -huh. Yeah, so mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and that's and that's actually a quote that doesn't have to do with spiritualism, but it has to do with um, the the position of the first lady, and I think that was Lou Hoover that 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 did that quote, and now I can't remember the whole thing, but. Uh, that talked about this elevator. Do you either of you remember this elevated yeah. position? Yeah, mm -hmm. I want to say it's the Cougar. I mm -hmm. can't tell you what it is. You stopped me. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, where would you recommend that we go to learn more on this topic? We have, and usually I put that on here, shame on me. We have a website. It is uh, www.firstladies.org. And we have extensive biographies on all of the First Ladies. And uh, we have a blog site with different articles, but our website really has a lot of information. And uh, of course, come to Canton and visit our site. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, do you have any upcoming programs either uh, this year or into next year that would be of interest for us to Our education in? director may be able to answer that question. <laughs> you have yeah. Michael McDonald coming, and yes, I can't remember the name. Michael McDonald. Do you want to come up here? No, besides oh, that, okay. because our videographer has to. Michelle, you might want to do this too. Um, <laughs> they, see, they thought they came to DC this time, and I was going to do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm going to 
gosh, we have Janet. She's coming. Janet is yes. coming in November. Yes, it looks like we're going to do it in November. We're very excited. Mm -hmm. We do a variety of things. She's doing a book on Governor Lily Wallace. Yes, and it's uh, a woman. And so of course oh. we promote women, not just first ladies, but women who have had a contact with first ladies because we could be about anything mm -hmm. at that point. So we try to make the first ladies still most important. If you've had a contact with first ladies, and believe me, it's not hard because first ladies have a contact with everybody. Mm -hmm. So Janice is coming next year. Mr. McDonald from the Johnson Library is going to be at our site in a few March. months in March. Mm -hmm. And his topic, he's changed it a few times, <laughs> but it's, um, what is it, Michelle Help? Um, it was supposed to be Recently. on the political um, cartoons that were done of Lady Bird Johnson during um, mm -hmm. her beautification. Oh, I do remember. Mm -hmm. But I think that he's going to expand that and it's going to be more about um, presidential gifts and the, the very kind of odd things that, they, yes. that they're given and how you have to be kind of gracious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it should be really fun. Uh, yeah. fortune to be there. Yes, um, yes. For the, um, we saw Mrs. Oh, it was a wonderful, we just Earth. say that. Uh, two years ago, we were there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, both Mrs. Bushes were on the stage together oh, and the whole in symposium. For the symposium, yes, mm -hmm. and the presidential children. Quite honestly, there isn't a whole lot um, that we can, that we learn new about First Ladies because we are in it every day of our every lives. Day. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's, but we, it, it's hard for people to say, you know, we can just say, no, -uh, that didn't happen. We haven't found that document. <laughs> but when we went there, it was fascinating to hear people speak to children. That's where we were, we were very excited because the children spilled everything. <laughs> <laughs> the first ladies, uh uh, what you read in their books is what you get. They don't steal. But we went to, through the library with Mr. McDonald, and he did have the most fascinating um, stories on their collections. So we said, why don't you talk about that? Mm -hmm. Like the, can I tell about the tubes? Yeah, you should, that's your mm -hmm. favorite. <laughs> I know it is. I do a program on the presidential pets for children, and it's, it's fun. But anyway, um, we looked at these tubes, and I saw something. Oh, it was a little box, but yay long. Mm -hmm. And it said him. The moon was her, and I thought, oh, this can't be. Oh, no. The cremains oh. of him and her, the beagles. Yes. Oh. And so he had all these wonderful <laughs> stories. And so we said, why don't you talk about the collection? So he's going to be there. Um, what else is coming up? We've got um, we have the, all kinds of programs of my own that are coming up with um, uh, uh, White House Weddings is coming up. He would be interested because oh, Alice. <laughs> 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 and our things are factual. Uh, I mean, truly factual. We, we let people go away uh, with thinking whatever they want. Other, uh, we don't influence. We present the facts as interestingly as we can, but as truthfully as we can. And, but so the weddings of Francis Cleveland, of, um, of Edith Galt Wilson, who was married during that time uh, period, though not in the White House. Uh, another first lady married Trish, in Trish, well, the White House, I can't remember. Uh, Julia, right? Julia, uh, Julia, Julia, Tyler, Julia, Tyler. Tyler. Julia Tyler is a real character. Right. Good thing he was only in office a little while, because she probably would have gone impeached. You know, for <laughs> some of the things that she did. But a lovely lady. And the daughters, so that's coming up. But at the legacy lectures, we try to bring them in um, whenever we can get them. I can't think of anybody else. I know we've got someone else coming. Well, we're partnering with the Harding Home. We are. Oh, the Harding Home does a uh, symposium every year in July, and usually it's on some topic related to Warren Harding. Well, this year they decided to do a symposium related to First Ladies, and so we're partnering with them, and uh, it's going to be in Marion, Ohio, July 18th and 19th, I believe. And there's going to be a number of speakers, uh, some authors who have written about uh, Grace Coolidge and about um, Lou Hoover, and Sherry Hall, who is the site manager at the Harding Home, will speak about Florence Harding. I am going to kind of talk, then do, do kind of a bridge from Eleanor Roosevelt up into modern times, and then um, two other panelists that day will be Gary Walters, who is the chief usher of the White House. From, um, he was appointed by Reagan, but he was actually at the White House from the time of Ford, and he retired in 2007. And then there's a dinner that evening, and the keynote speaker will be Capricia Marshall, who worked for years with Hillary Clinton. So it's going to be a great lineup, and, and I forget exactly the, the title of the 
It's, it's modern first ladies, but yeah, it's the type of floor and song. But we do all yeah. kinds of programs and all kinds of topics. We are mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Obama's uh, first garden. Um, we call it, uh, I even wrote it, I can't think what I call it. It's mm -hmm. called um, Fun Fitness in Fun the First Garden. The first garden. Mm -hmm. And we've teamed up with uh, um, another uh, center for this all, all day children's and adults seem to love it too uh, event. We do the historic part of our site and all about, it's all about the. Um, uh, the way that the lawn has changed over the years, and then of course we go to Mrs. Obama's um, present um, project, and the fitness, and then the rest of the day they go to um, Star Parks for the real lawn site, and they teach nutrition there too, mm -hmm. through like a, a duck that was not fed properly. <laughs> so the duck will never be the same as other ducks. They've saved it. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful way to teach children. So those are the kinds of things we do. We try to get in, in the first ladies. Projects um, for adults, we do history. Um, we probably never do scandals because that was the president's problem, not the first ladies. <laughs> we don't know what their reaction was to it because they don't tell it. Well, they have been asked from time to time, why don't we do an exhibit or a program on second ladies? <laughs> <laughs> anything and because first ladies were truly interested in everything because they were women, the sky's the limit with them. So does that answer a little bit? Can I plug my own? Um, I'm in charge of the exhibits and right now it's uh, Forgotten First Ladies. And so we're talking to help Chris down. Okay. Um, uh, right now I'm in charge of exhibits and um, <laughs> Uh, I, we're doing Forgotten First Ladies, which is really looking at, you could say a lot of First Ladies are forgotten, um, that's why we're, we're there. But we look at a lot of the First Ladies, unlike Mary Lincoln and Dolly Madison, who really made their husband only at a four-year term, or um, just because of the times, being a Victorian First Lady, um, you were supposed to be seen and not heard. And so their roles were limited to being the, the hostess of the White House. Sometimes they didn't even choose to do that. So um, this looks at those first ladies uh, highlighting uh, Letitia uh, Tyler, who died in the White House, um, Abigail Fillmore, Margaret Taylor, Eliza Johnson. Um, all these that I'm sure just come right off the top of the but um, that don't are, are public. So, and it's really difficult to do exhibits on these women because they are uh, just not really celebrated as women. And I think it's a testament to how far we've come as women um, that we're uh, that we even have the we're allowed to celebrate these these women, and they they, they stand for our female um, ancestors who we don't know much about other than their name. So, thank you. <laughs> um, because uh, women have, we have come so far, what happens to the um, museum when there's a first husband? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's interesting, and we have talked about this. Oh, first and, man, I guess you You know, in, in, in planning this organization, we didn't really um, think about that, but the U.S. Mint actually looked ahead and they have decided to encompass that first spouse because when they came out with the presidential coin series and they came out with the companion series, they named it the first spouse coin. And, you know, what will we do? Well, you know, the first spouse will, will have to have some kind of recognition. Um, what do I think is going to happen with the role? Well, I think in a way it's going to push the role forward because I think that once we have a first spouse he's going to be able to stay active in his career and the country isn't going to think a thing of it. You know, um, there was um, Mitt Rom and Ann Romney I think that made the statement that if he became president she wanted to continue with her, with her um, law career. And people were like, oh my goodness, you can't do that. But when we have a first spouse, I think it's going to happen. I think, you know, things will go along as they have been, that he'll make public appearances, 
but I think some of the detail, the state dinner planning and things like that, is going to go to the staff. And a lot of it is done by the staff anyways. The interesting thing will be then, when there is a first lady again, will she be able to then keep her career? And I'm thinking yes, yes, it's going to push the role forward. And didn't Lady Bird Johnson speak to some women and say, I hope someone among here will follow in my footsteps and become President Spass. I wish him, him well. And that was Barbara Bush. Yes, yes, yes. And I wish him well. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Well, thank you very much. Yes, well, thank you. Pat and entourage <laughs> for the great presentation. I uh, don't want to miss an opportunity. One of our uh, honored guests came in late. Melinda, uh, would you stand up? Uh, Melinda Machado uh, is a longtime supporter of Autumn. Hello. She's the, uh, public Affairs Director for the National Museum of American History, one of the Smithsonian Museums. Uh, she's one of our longtime supporters. Thank you. Uh, for Chris, Christopher Reich, anybody want to ask about grants or anything? <laughs> well, you know, okay, if not, you can speak to him privately here if you want to know about grants or uh, museums. The and, inside uh, track. The inside track. Yeah. <laughs> the horse's mouth. Yes, the horse's mouth on that. So thank you all very much. You made a wonderful third anniversary. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.